Hi, this is Jack from Anatomy Zone, and in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at the tibia and the fibula. And so we thought it's probably best to look at these two together because they're so closely approximated to one another and work together to allow the leg to function. So firstly, the tibia and the fibula form the leg. And remember that we're referring to this in an anatomical sense where the leg refers to that which is from the knee and below. The tibia, which is commonly referred to as the shin bone, is the second strongest bone in the human body, and it carries all of our weight down through and into the foot. Whereas the fibula, which is Latin for pin or clasp, provides much more of a supportive role, so it has a very insignificant role in weight bearing, and in literature this is stated to be less than 10%. So this has some clinical consequences which are important, and just to note that the fibula provides a great site for bone grafting, because if you remove a bit of the fibula out, then it's not really going to impact on the stability of the lower leg. And secondly, if you have a fracture of the fibula, and this is specific really to those which are in the proximal aspect of the bone, and those which aren't really largely displaced, you can actually allow the patient to mobilise as the pain allows without any cast immobilization. However, the majority of the fibula's role is actually in providing support, particularly lateral support to the ankle, where it has an extremely important role. So now let's think about the articulations that these bones have. So exclusive to the tibia at the top is the tibiofemoral joint, which is part of that knee joint. Um, and then between the tibia and the fibula, we have the superior and inferior tibiofibula joints. And then distally on the fibula and the tibia, they also form joints either side with the talus to form the talocrural joint, or what we commonly known as the ankle joint. So now let's think about orientating ourselves to these bones. So firstly, let's just take the tibia. So the tibia is quite easy to orientate yourself to. So to find the front of the tibia, so the anterior aspect of the tibia, you find the bump, which is at the top. This bump's called the tibial tuberosity, which is here. And so if you find that, then you know that's the front. And then if you find the base of it, you should find there's a, there's a lump at the bottom, which is called the medial malleolus. And this face is obviously towards the midline. So in this particular example, this is a right-sided tibia. So the fibula is much harder to orientate yourself to. And the only real way to properly do this is, is actually to get the bone itself and, and feel both ends or tap both ends. One end will feel flatter, and that's the head, and one end will feel much more pointy, and that's the lateral malleolus. Once you've found the lateral malleolus, then you know that that's the distal part of the fibula, and then what you've got to do is find which way around it is, and what you do to find that is to look for this part here, which is that concave section on the inner aspect of the fibula, which is the lateral malleolar fossa, and this bit just joins onto your talus. So once you find that concave bit, you know that that's the inside bit, and you've effectively got your laterality to that bone, so you've been able to orientate yourself, and in this case, this is a right-sided fibula. So now we're just going to go through the bones themselves. I'm going to start with the tibia and we're going to go top to bottom, okay? So thinking about the proximal structures on the tibia. So firstly, you've got these two large bumps. You've got a medial and lateral condyle, which are these shelf-like projections. And on the top, it's quite flat. And this is called the tibial plateau on the top. And you've got a medial and lateral section to that. And those condyles obviously house the femoral condyles. Now, the tibial plateau, the medial and lateral tibial plateau, join in the middle to form the intercondylar eminence, which is this raised bit in the middle, this lip in the middle of the tibia. And the intercondylar eminence is important because it allows the, the attachment of three structures anteriorly on it and three structures posteriorly. So just taking this view, so a top-down view, effectively bird's eye view, so looking at the intercondylar eminence, on the anterior section of it, most anteriorly, we'll have the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. Then just behind that, you have your anterior cruciate ligament. And then behind that, you have your anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And then looking at the posterior part of the intercondylar eminence, at the front of that bit, you've got the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, and then you have the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, and then most posteriorly, you've got your posterior cruciate ligament. And so to summarize that kind of basically, essentially the um, intercondylar eminence just allows us to attach our menisci and our cruciate ligaments. And so finally, the last thing to notice on the proximal aspect of the tibia is this bump which we visited on the front of the bone, which is called the tibial tuberosity. So this provides the attachment point for the quadriceps via the patella tendon. And just as a clinical aside, the tibial tuberosity can be an important landmark for children presenting with knee pain. So there is a growth plate that develops underneath the tibial tuberosity at four to six months postnatally, and this fuses at 16 years old. And particularly in kids that play a lot of sports, you can effectively get an overuse injury here, where the quadricep muscle bulk and strength actually overdevelops itself, and so it's pulling against this relatively weak growth plate, and over time that repetitive strain of the tibial tuberosity can cause very small evulsion fractures, which means it's pulling the bone away, and as these repair, the tibial tuberosity grows, so it's enlarged and it's painful, and it's known as a traction apophysitis, which goes by the name of Osgood Schlatter's disease, and this tends to run a course in which it sort of burns out as you become an adult. So next, let's just think about the shaft of the tibia. Now, the tibia is effectively a triangle in shape on its shaft. So there's three borders and there's three surfaces. So firstly, just to go to the borders, there's an anterior border, a medial border, and an interosseous border. And then to go through the surfaces, we then have a medial surface, which is the smooth, flat part, which is often called the shin. And that's very subcutaneous. You can feel that very easily. And that runs from the medial condyle of the tibia right down to the, the that inner aspect of your ankle. Um, and we also have a lateral surface, which is ever so slightly concave, and that, that houses the tibialis anterior. And we have a posterior surface. And on the posterior surface, the, the most important thing really to note on here is this ridge, and that's called the soleal line, and that houses the soleus muscle. So now just looking at the distal aspect, so effectively the shaft itself tapers so it gets smaller for two thirds of its length, and then it broadens in the last third, creating the medial malleolus, which is the most distal point, and that forms the inner portion of the ankle. 
And so just to add a little bit more to this, the tibia is the commonest fractured long bone in our body. And the fractures that occur in it tend to be between the junction that is from the upper two thirds and the lower third of the bone, because in that region you have a much poorer blood supply. And particularly the proximity of that medial surface to the skin also mean that it means that it's a very high risk to be a compound fracture where there's a break in the skin around the broken bone. And therefore, because of that, it's, it's actually more likely to get infected as well. So now let's just think about the fibula. So at the superior portion of the fibula, we have the head. And that has a medial facet for articulation with the lateral condyle of the tibia. And the head also provides attachment to the biceps femoris muscle, which is one of your hamstring muscles that bends the knee. And finally, the head also allows attachment of the lateral collateral ligament, which is one of the ligaments that stabilizes the lateral aspect of your knee. And then just below the head is the neck of the fibula. And that's particularly important because it provides a channel around which the common perineal nerve runs. And clinically, that's important because if you fracture the head or the neck of the fibula, there's a risk that you'll damage this nerve. And clinically, you'll see a patient with a foot drop, which is where they can no longer dorsiflex their foot and they present with their foot in this position. Then the fibula, similarly to the tibia, has three borders on the shaft. It has an anterior border, an interosseous border, and a posterior border. And distally, it forms this bump here, which is the lateral malleolus. Now, that's lower than the tibial's medial malleolus, and that allows actually a little bit more stability to be provided to that lateral part of the ankle. And that's very important because the lateral part of our ankle is very easily injured. And that's commonly seen in um, ankle sprains where the mechanism of injury is almost exclusively an inversion injury. So I hope that you found this tutorial useful, um, and thanks for supporting us. If you have, then watch some of our other videos, subscribe to our channel, and check out our website, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks.